I think a lot of times people like introduce speakers by saying like, my next guest needs no introduction. <laughs> I do. Uh, I am definitely the kind of person who needs an introduction. Um, when Jeremy first approached me to do this talk, he uh, took me to Lucky Boys and, and talked to me about what Creative Mornings was. And he said, you know, some people we invite to speak at these things because they're local celebrities and we know that people will turn out for them and they're already really interested in what they have to say. And some people we invite because we just know they'll have great content. <laughs> and he paused. And he said, and we think you're going to have some great content. <laughs> the joke's on Jeremy, though, because disappointing people is my passion. It's my, it's my highest calling in life. Um, I thought all the same that I might be able to say something about this month's theme, which is truth all the same, because um, I spend a lot of time working as a restaurant critic and a food writer, which means I spend a lot of time telling people who wish I'd just shut up things that they don't want to hear. <laughs> uh, I've been writing monthly restaurant reviews for The Pitch since 2016, um, and there's a lot out there that you can read if you have a masochistic streak and unlimited uh, free time, <laughs> but most people know me, if they know me at all, for like one of three reviews. <laughs> Uh, so, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, in 2019, I accused Guy Fieri's Dive and Taco Joint in the Power and Light District of uh, failing to deliver on Guy Fieri, uh, nay Guy Ramsey Fieri's uh, maximalist frosted tipped ethos. Um, <laughs> Uh, in 2021, I wrote a scathing <laughs> review of Society, the cynical restaurant slash nightclub slash immersive PowerPoint presentation across the street. Um, so apologies to anyone who popped over here before their shift. Um, and a few short months ago, um, I wrote a somewhat bewildered review of... Uh, that, I did not write the headline. I think that was all Brock Wilbur, who's here in the back. Um, <laughs> and uh, I tried to unpack uh, the strange stadium-lit presence of the Taco Bell Cantina for uh, a rapidly changing Westport. Um, the one thing that all three of those reviews had in common was that they were extremely negative. <laughs> Uh, the ugly truth is that people really like reading critical restaurant reviews. Um, I think there's a sort of salacious and schadenfreude element to it, sure, but um, I also think there's something that feels sort of transgressive and refreshing uh, to read something honest, especially in an era of sponsored content and republished press releases. Um, sure, people are still abject assholes. Uh, it's never been easier to blast people online with a bunch of uncharitable critiques, although I hear Elon Musk is working on that. Um, <laughs> but I think it's also never felt harder to say something sincerely critical without a bunch of humorless scolds crawling out of the metaphorical and literal chamber of commerce to uh, tell you to you're ruining their good time. <laughs> Uh, I am a Midwesterner by birth, which means I was raised on a pretty steady diet of, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. <laughs> I think a lot of us were. Uh, and that's such a manipulative phrase, right? I mean, it seems to me that it's exactly when we're being nice that we're so often communicating nothing of value. That doesn't mean, I think, that everyone should have free dispensation to be a total jagweed, OK? Like, it's, it's good to be nice. But naked boosterism is not a kindness. That's not nice because it doesn't help people and places and vegetables and minerals become the highest expression of what they want to be. It doesn't really require courage. It doesn't even require curiosity. It doesn't really require much effort at all. It's safe, which is another way of saying that it's kind of lazy. I have a vested interest in defending what I do, obviously, so you should be kind of immediately skeptical of this framing. <laughs> um, but I do believe that criticism, when practiced responsibly, and that is admittedly a big caveat, responsibly, um, is at its core a form of love. Because you have to love something to meet it with honest curiosity. You have to love something to take at face value what it wants to be and what it wants to do and evaluate how close it's getting there. 
You have to love something to spend hours studying it and engaging with it and giving it chance after chance to disappoint you. <laughs> so every restaurant I review, here are like trade secrets, uh, I visit a minimum of three times. Um, when a review is leaning especially negative, sometimes I'll go four times. Sometimes I will go five. Um, because I'm looking for any glimmer of hope. I'm looking for any little flash of brilliance that I can point to and say like, hey, you know, they're not getting it right yet, but they've got this, like there's a gesture. <sighs> but, you know, true criticism, I think capital T truth with the little trademark symbol always has to start from a place of sincere engagement and love. And that doesn't mean that it has to be gentle. Because when you love something, when you believe fervently in its mission and with the people who are tasked with achieving it, any gulf between what's promised and what's delivered is going to feel like an existential threat. When you care about something, the stakes are too high to sit back and watch it fail, or worse, to actively cause harm. So that brings me to the fourth piece that people might know me for which uh, was an expose co-written with uh, <laughs> uh, So this was an expose co-written with Natalie Gallagher at Kansas City Magazine about the Westport restaurant Port Fonda, uh, asterisk, under new management. Um, it came out in early 2021 um, as the restaurant was preparing to reopen after the pandemic. And at the time, everyone from Congress to local people in the industry were talking about, we got to save restaurants. We've got to save them. We've got to save restaurants. And I think fewer people were talking about which aspects of restaurants weren't worth saving. So um, Natalie and I wrote a piece about a restaurant that seemed to embody everything that I wanted the industry to leave behind. So there was screaming, there was belittling staff, there was throwing equipment across the room in a fit of rage or cocaine, depending on who you ask, um, sexually harassing staff members, employing sexist and racist hiring practices, um, generally treating employees as less than human. Naturally, the one thing most readers seemed to care about was that the chef had served food out of the trash. <laughs> Uh, when that piece was published, a lot of people accused me of participating in cancel culture. And uh, I'm not really interested in wading into the debate about whether cancel culture exists or you know, whether that was an example of it. Smarter people than me have done that and I don't really have anything new to add. Uh, but I will say I didn't write the story because I wanted to tear down one particular chef or one particular restaurant. Uh, to be frank, I'm not all that interested in stories where the bottom line is Boo this man, <laughs> like, <laughs> boo him. <laughs> uh, people try to get me to write those stories all the time and I rarely bite. Um, I wrote that story because Port Fonda was more typical than it was exceptional. Um, it was the kind of place that replicated the same exploitative labor structures that the service industry has coasted on for decades and that the restaurant had failed catastrophically to imagine a way of continuing on without them. So that's what made the story interesting to me. You know, there seemed to be an opportunity to change the conversation. That doesn't mean that everyone saw it that way. Uh, there are much better ways to become popular than being a critic. Uh, it's a lot easier and faster to take another path if that's your goal. Uh, over the course of my relatively short and not all that influential career, I've had unsigned threatening letters mailed to my home address. I've had signed public calls for me to be fired or flogged or sent to night classes in journalism. Um, <laughs> I've been threatened with lawsuits and I once had a local nonprofit send details of my sexual assault to one of my editors to try to argue that that experience disqualified me from reporting on sexual harassment. I'm still a little crabby about that one, to be honest. Um, it, it comes with the territory, though. Like, I, don't, I try not to take it personally. Um, the thing I get accused of the most often, though, which all actually brings me a little pleasure, is being a hater. <laughs> yeah. uh, so one of the things I did during the pandemic was start a newsletter. <laughs> and I called it Haterade. 
Uh, and I think Caitlin Betts is here. She did the logo, so if you like that, that's all her. She did a great job. <laughs> Uh, so I, I called it Haterade, and originally I started this kind of just as a way to keep writing regularly during the pandemic because, you know, restaurants were closed, no one needed a review. Um, I still needed to write. I can't stop, as it turns out. I'm drawn to it compulsively, the way uh, my cat is drawn to the one area rug in the house when she has to puke. Like, I just, it's the, <laughs> it's the pull. <laughs> And I news, used the newsletter to write about things that like, I was really into, but that I knew uh, no sane editor would pay me to write. So you know, I made garlic bread flavored chapstick. I investigated the history of the apple teeny. I recreated soggy school lunch pizza. You remember the big rectangles? Um, and I wrote about the way that nostalgia works in food. Um, and I did all of that, and I still do it for, for no pay and for a, a very small audience. Um, <laughs> And this year, one of those pieces uh, that I wrote for no pay and for a very small audience was published in Best American Food Writing 2022. Um, I had hoped for years and years that one of my reviews would make it into that anthology. Um, <laughs> But I actually no longer think that it's a crazy coincidence or like sheer dumb luck that it was a haterade piece that someone noticed because I think what little conventional success I've had has come almost entirely from doing things with less prestige that I was really personally invested in. It felt surprising, um, that revelation felt surprising to me because I don't think I had used the same lens that I use in my criticism to think about my own career. When I review restaurants, I always start by asking myself about the project that a restaurant is trying to undertake. So what is this place trying to be? I might not like the concept, but what does it want to do? And it took me a long time to ask myself that question um, and to be truthful about the answer. And I think it's only in the last year or so that I've been able to let go of the things that I felt like I had to do to get noticed or the, the places that I had to publish to have prestige and respect. Um, and instead focus on the things that I really love uh, and find joyful and stimulating on their own. And I have to do it for love because I sure as shit can't do it for money. <laughs> uh, I'm a freelancer and, and freelance journalism, much like crime, does not pay. Um, <laughs> most critics out there are freelancers uh, these days. Every year there are fewer and fewer full-time critics um, and there are fewer people willing to pay for them. Uh, this is a problem across the industry. This is not just Kansas City. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little story that uh, I think you'll find sad, but that I find weirdly inspiring. Um, so in 2020, I won second place in the, um, this National Restaurant Criticism Award sponsored by the Association of Food Journalists. And at the time, I was just over the moon. You know, um, I was so excited. My competitors were people like Ryan Sutton at Eater and um, Solejo at the San Francisco Chronicle. They're these big, big critics in the industry, like big names. Um, and the organization, I respected the hell out of it. I loved the Association of Food Journalists because it was a professional organization that had established the code of ethics that critics and food writers follow. Um, everyone in the organization has to sign an ethics pledge. It was longer than my mortgage disclosure, truthfully. Um, and the pledge had rules for restaurant review in, in general. So how many times do you have to visit before you write a review? How long do you have to wait after it opens to go? Um, but it also had rules about conflicts of interest. So no comps, no freebies, no sponsorships, no PR uh, connections or gigs. A few months after I received that award, the Association of Food Journalists shut down for good. The funding model for journalism had changed dramatically, and it turns out they couldn't afford to keep operating without advertising and sponsorship money. Uh, they couldn't see a way to survive without breaking the ethics pledge that they had worked so hard to uphold. I've never really been able to figure out a way to survive on criticism either. Um, so I have another unglamorous truth that I will admit to you, which is that as long as I've been writing about restaurants, I have also had a full-time corporate editing job to pay the bills. I'm skipping out on that day job right now to be here. Um, and I'm hoping no one notices. I'm really flying under the radar. Uh, and 
whenever I tell people that, you know, that I that I have a day job, they usually wince and they're like, oh man, I mean, you'll get there someday. <laughs> like, I mean, don't quit your day job is an insult, right? Like, I think there's like the sense that I should feel like a, a sense of failure or resignation because I have that. But I don't think a creative life has to be all consuming to be valid. And I think it's okay if your art is just a passion and not a profession. Just a passion, as if that wasn't enough. But that's taken me a long time to learn. Um, and maybe that's something that some other people in this room have struggled with as well. So um, I wanted to break all of the rules of storytelling and good sense and, and take you back in time in chronology to uh, a version of me who was once even dumber than I am now, <laughs> as is my custom. So uh, before I was ever a writer, I was an actor. Um, I was a college theater major, and I loved it. I loved it so much. I loved rehearsing until 11 p.m. every night with these oversexed neurotics who just like threw every <laughs> inch of themselves into it like a golden retriever with bad depth perception. They were just <laughs> flopping all over the place. Um, I, I loved the sensory overload of the scene shop. You know, you hear table saws grinding, screws stripping, because you've got this inexperienced contractor <laughs> railing away. You would walk out with like sawdust all over your shoes, like pine scented snow. It was magical. And I loved the monastic quiet of the costume department, too, where there was nothing but this little puff of a steam iron and the chattering of sergers. Uh, more than anything, though, I love the people who were all to a man completely insane. <laughs> One of the most insane of them was this man named Richard Glockner, um, or as he would say, Richard Glockner. <laughs> <laughs> he was the lead acting professor at my university, and he was just a cartoonishly intense man. Um, he radiated airborne contagious daddy issues. <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> I'm going to just paint you a word picture. He had this like wispy white hair, like um, the, the mold on the flesh of a peach. And he would walk into class every morning drinking these like disgusting looking green protein shakes that had the texture of paper mache. Um, he was grizzled, and he was bitter, and he was mean, and he would make us look at pictures of dead Palestinian children during class. Um, I think he just felt like we always needed to be at this like intensely heightened emotional state to uh, create art. Oh my God. And at least once a semester, he would break every single one of his students down like a horse until they were sobbing in front of the class. Oh God, and we adored him for it. <laughs> we loved him. Uh, my final year of acting school, one of my classmates raised her hand during an acting studio class and she said, uh, hey Richard, is it okay if I leave early today? Uh, her mom was retiring that day after a 50 year career and she wanted to make the retirement party. And Richard told her that she could do as she pleased. And then he started in on a lecture for the entire class. And he said, unless you want this more than anything, Unless you're willing to sacrifice everything else in your life to make this dream come true, you're not going to make it. And I sensed that some people found this inspiring. I found it really demoralizing because I could think of a dozen things I wanted to do in that moment more than be an actor. I wanted to be loved. I wanted to spend time with my friends. I wanted to get plowed in the green room and eat a cheeseburger and then have a cold <laughs> can of hams. Uh, I met my husband in theater school, incidentally. He's over there. Wait a second. Hey! <laughs> and I could also think at the time of a dozen things I wasn't willing to sacrifice to achieve that goal of being an actor. You know, uh, my principles, time with my family getting plowed and eating cheeseburgers. <laughs> so I, I quit acting as soon as I graduated, and I never went on a single audition. Instead, I threw myself fully into the other great love of my life, which was writing. And I moved to Kansas City, and I went to get my MFA in creative writing at UMKC. And during my MFA program, I had an internship at the Kansas City Star, where I wrote one book review a week. It was a dream job. 
except to the extent that it was not a job because it was not paid. <laughs> And I guess as a note here, the Star no longer publishes book reviews, nor do they publish theater reviews or art reviews or food reviews, because criticism is not valued in a literal sense, even if I value it in a philosophical one. But anyway, as part of that internship, I got to interview writers sometimes, which was really exciting for me as a, as a young writer in Kansas City. And one of the writers I got to interview was this uh, Pulitzer Prize winning novelist, Richard Ford. He's a really great writer, if you've ever heard of him. Um, fantastic guy. It was, just a really incredible opportunity for 22-year-old me to be able to talk to him, and I was, I was so giddy. He was doing exactly what I wanted to do. And so at the end of the interview, I say, you know, Richard, I am in an MFA program right now. I guess I just wondered if you had any advice for a young writer like me. And he lowered his voice, and he got very serious, and he said, yeah, I've got some advice. Do something else. <laughs> I uh, wrote down the entire quote because um, it's emblazoned on the back of my brain and also the interview was recorded. Um, and he said, talk yourself out of it if you can possibly do it because you're probably gonna fail. It's probably going to be a waste of time. It's probably gonna make you very unhappy. You're not gonna end up with the feeling that you've been useful to the world. You might end up broke. Your marriage might break up. And if you can't do that, if you can't talk yourself out of it, then maybe, just maybe you have the beginnings of a vocation. So I said, thank you very much, sir. <laughs> and, and I hung up the phone, and I turned off my little recorder, and I, I stared at the wall of my cubicle in the bullpen blankly for about 30 minutes, just trying to figure out what the hell that was. The thing is, the Richards thought they were being helpful. The Richards thought they were telling me the truth. And at the time, I wasn't mature enough to know that I was letting my dreams be dictated by two dicks. <laughs> yeah. It is probably true that to have Richard Ford's career, you have to have Richard Ford's singular devotion and tolerance for divorce. But... <laughs> But that's not the only way to be a writer. That's not the only way to be dedicated to your craft. There are admittedly drawbacks to the route that I have chosen as well. You know, there are days when at 5 p.m. I close up my laptop and I take out another laptop and I open it up and I feel like that gif of Grandpa Simpson when he like walks in the bar, takes off his hat, turns back around and walks right out again. <laughs> But on the whole, I've never felt happier and more settled about the work that I'm doing than I do right now because I finally know what kind of writer I'm trying to be. And it's the kind of writer who could do lots of other things, but chooses to write anyway, on her own terms, on her own timeline, at a sustainable pace, and for an audience that's engaged but not necessarily growing. So yeah, to return to that initial invitation to speak from Jeremy, I'm probably never going to be a local celebrity. Um, I'm probably always going to be the kind of person who needs an introduction. But I don't feel that as a loss. Um, because when I'm truthful about myself, about what I want, it's not notoriety or awards or glossy magazine publications, although, you know, those things are nice. What I want is to be able to write what I love at a sustainable pace that allows me to dedicate the time to it that I need to make it good, or at least as good as I can make it. I recognize that's not an especially glamorous vision of a creative life, it's, it's not sexy, um, but I think the truth rarely is. That's all I got, thank you. Yeah.